Hello, I'm Chris Sugden. Today we're going to look at the Trinity. The teaching of the Trinity is a statement about Jesus, that he's God. And this is made clear in the legacy words that Jesus gives at the end of Matthew's Gospel. We read that Jesus had told the disciples after the resurrection to go and meet him in Galilee. Matthew writes, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Matthew is telling us that when the disciples met Jesus at the mountain in Galilee, they worshipped him. This is the difference between Jesus and all other religious leaders. His followers worship him. He is a prophet, but more than a prophet. If he were only a prophet, a teacher and an example, we would have a, have a religion of laws and high ideals. But no forgiveness of our sins, no hope of victory over death, and no transforming power of his spirit. The human spirit wants to worship. The cult of celebrity testifies to that. Roman emperors wanted to be worshipped. Such worship makes us less than the humans we adore. Christians worship no one except Jesus. That worship lifts our eyes, expands our horizons, and takes us to where he is, who has already fulfilled our destiny in his resurrection. Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who would give it him? Only God the Father. And the God the Father has given him all authority. Not some, all. So when Jesus says no one can come to the Father except through him, there's no room for anyone else. God has given him all authority. Where? In heaven and earth. Not just in our private lives, but in the public square. And whatever people's prowess in their public careers, Jesus has authority over their private lives too. He is judge of all. And then he tells them, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of Jesus. Encourage, exhort, enable other people to be disciples of Jesus, to worship him and follow him. Go to all nations. Jesus is Lord of all nations. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He is God. Then he tells them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Initiate them, in other words, into his way, of, into his way and into his life through baptism to unite them in his death to sin symbolised through the rite of baptism by drowning in water and uniting them in his resurrection to new life, symbolised by coming up out of the water after baptism. Our celebration of the Trinity is a celebration that in Jesus we meet God in person. He does not just tell us about God, he is God, and through him we meet God face to face. Christian teaching is not just to give us information. 
information about God only gives us troubled piety. Such troubled piety does not live by a delivering act of God, but by our own exertions. We need to be brought face to face with the reality of Jesus. An encounter with Jesus is an encounter with God because Jesus is God and equal with God the Father. All God's authority has been given to Jesus. The Gospels present a Jesus who in his radical spirit of unconditional love reaches out and touches the lives of the marginalised, the oppressed, the poor, the unclean, the sinners, even the Gentiles. And in doing so, he bursts through the barriers and ethnic boundaries treasured and insisted on by religious leaders. Jesus' uncompromising confrontations with the religious leaders on this revolutionary love escalates after his entry into Jerusalem and costs him his life as they crucify him on the cross. This is the story of Jesus' revelation of his Father, the God of radical, unconditional love. But Jesus is also human. His temptations, his agonising decision to conform his will to the Father's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, his terrible sufferings on the cross, all these show that he was fully human. The early Christians argued that to save us, Jesus had to be God, no less. But to save us, he had to be fully human. Saving us is a life and death matter. Paul makes it clear uh, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 8 and verse 12. He tells us that we live in the, in the sphere of death. So Romans 8, 12 reads as follows. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So Paul is telling us that our natural habitat, where we live, is the sphere of death. If we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. But then he says, if by the Spirit of God you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. There are two spheres here, death and life. And Jesus transfers us from the sphere of death into the sphere of life. And in the sphere of life, we are led by the Spirit of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have the spirit of sonship. We cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And we experience sonship and are heirs with Christ as we share his sufferings and so will share his glory. Paul is speaking here clearly of the being and persons of God. To speak of God as three persons, yet one God, is speaking of the reality of the Christian experience of God. If you ask the question, where was God when Jesus died and was in the tomb? He was still the creator, upholding the universe, even though Jesus was dead. So there's more to God than Jesus. Jesus is fully God, but not all there is to God. Also, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, the disciples and we experience Jesus by his Spirit. Who we have with us is really God. We do not experience through the Spirit a lesser God or an angel of God. We are drawn into the same relationship 
that Jesus had with God by the Spirit of God. We are drawn into his experience of sonship. And in this experience, we call God Abba. And by the reality of the Spirit, God dwells in us. And so Paul tells us, we have not received the spirit of slaves to be slaves again to fear. A spirit of civility. The, the spirit that says, unless I do this and so, do this and in such a way and never question it or have a mind of my own, that's slavery, that's civility. That slavery is to the law. Unless I do this and this and this, or because I've done that and that and that, God will be pleased with me. No, we're spirit, we have the spirit of God's sons. And that's not just merely a biological fact, it's rather like uh, the being of a company, like Barrett and Sons or Shaw and Sons. We're in a partnership, we're in a team. Such a relationship doesn't depend on a rule book, though it does have boundaries. It depends on being in tune with one another. And so we cry, Abba, Father, by the Spirit. As we cry, Abba, Father, two voices are heard. There's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that no one can call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit in us to call Jesus Lord. But also, this is no overriding of our own consciousness. We ourselves know that is right, he is Lord. We rejoice to be able to call God our Father. A slave naturally rejects the notion of being a slave. Their spirit does not embrace it. A slave does not think that being a slave fulfills who they are and who they're meant to be. But to be a son means also one day inheriting the father's possessions. A slave will not inherit his master's possessions. So as Christians, we will one day enter onto the glorious inheritance that the Father has in store for us and which Christ has already entered on our behalf. How can we explain this relationship of the believer to the being of God? Is who we are in touch with, who bears witness with our spirit, God himself? It's the understanding of the Trinity that says, yes, God can be within us without us becoming God or with us, without us being absorbed into God because there are three persons. The Spirit is in us, yes, but God is also the creator sustaining the world and he's also the risen, ascended Jesus. For some religions... The problem is, how can God be associated with humans when he's so majestic and powerful? How can he be associated with their fallibilities and failures? The Christian response is that he retains his majesty, but expresses his relationship to us through being incarnate as the Son and present in us by the Spirit. So it will not do to say that all religions lead to the same God. They have very different ways of understanding and relating to God. It will not do to say that Jesus is just one representation of God. He has all authority. And Jesus works in harmony with the Father's will through the power of the Spirit. In Matthew 12, 28, Jesus says he cast out demons by the Spirit of God. He experienced this as his own inherent power, which was at the same time the power of the Spirit of his Father, who was present in him by the same Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes the Spirit of Jesus' love, compassion, integrity, radicalism, courage and humility, and enacts it in the obedient lives of the disciples who seek to keep in step with their master in the spirit. The Trinity teaches us to keep in mind the whole life-giving doctrine of the Christian God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>